In the late fall of 1964, Wong Jackman squeezed into a brown Pontiac Tempest, which already carried five other people. The group left Chinatown in San Francisco, the oldest and largest in the United States. They crossed the bay over the Bay Bridge connecting San Francisco and Oakland and drove up to the new Kung Fu School on Broadway Avenue in Oakland. It was at this time only recently been opened by Bruce Lee after his move to Oakland from Seattle. This visit was preceded by a war of words that had lasted several weeks. The tension grew and finally, the moment of truth came. Today's video is dedicated, you guessed it, to the legendary fight between Bruce Lee and Wong Jackman. There were only seven witnesses of this meeting held behind the closed doors of Bruce's school. However, the events of this evening had a huge impact on the world of martial arts. This battle not only influenced the formation of a man who would soon become the most famous fighter in the world, but also became a key moment in the confrontation between two philosophies traditional and modern mixed martial arts. The fight with Wong Jackman was a turning point for Bruce Lee, after which he created a philosophy of battle ahead of his time by decades. We can safely say that Bruce Lee became the forerunner of modern MMA, so it is vitally important to figure out what really happened that evening. The fact is that everything connected with the name of Bruce Lee has acquired legends and myths that often overshadow the truth. Truth which in the end is much more important than the heroic legacy of Bruce Lee. Hollywood heavily contributed to the misinformation surrounding this fight. In the movie The Birth of the Dragon, shot by George Nolfi in 2017, Wong Jackman is actually a Shaolin monk who made his way to the States to help Bruce fight the Mafia. This fiction is joined by the 1993 film Dragon, the story of Bruce Lee, in which Jason Scott Lee played the main role. You may remember him from his appearances on television. In that film, the fight takes place in front of the secret council of the ninja and ends with Wong's vile strike to Bruce Lee's back. In fact, the real story is far more interesting than all of the senseless Hollywood cliches. For those that are interested, we will now explore what led to this fight. For those who simply want specifics about the battle, timing marks will now appear on the screen so you can skip ahead to that point in the story. And so, we begin. From Seattle to Oakland In the early 1960s, the San Francisco Bay Area became home to numerous martial arts fans who arrived from South China, Hong Kong, and Hawaii. Around the same time, Bruce dropped out of college and the comfortable environment he had created for himself in Seattle and moved to Oakland, he went there to join his friends and associates as they improved and continued on the path of martial arts. The most important of these was James Lee, who was twice as old as Bruce and in his youth had a formidable reputation as a street fighter and bodybuilder. In addition, James was a true martial arts innovator in the United States. He published his own books, developed training equipment, and turned his garage into a martial arts study room. He introduced Bruce to his circle of friends, other progressively minded martial arts fanatics, including Japanese jiu-jitsu master Wally J and the creator of American Kempo Karate, Ed Parker. In general, Bruce found in Oakland what he really wanted to find, a unique laboratory for the study of martial arts, where he could practice and discuss martial arts 24-7 among experienced fighters and like-minded people. The time spent in Oakland laid key milestones in Bruce's life, including the creation of the only book he had ever published in his life, dating in Hollywood, the fight with Wong Jackman, and creating the concept of Jeet Kune Do. However, in most Bruce Lee biographies, minimal attention is usually paid to this time, despite its formative significance. Continuing with that trend, the film The Birth of the Dragon not only erases James Lee from his storyline, but also completely removes Oakland from its history, transforming the action to San Francisco, where Bruce's affairs were completely different. Chinatown In San Francisco, Bruce Lee faced a number of problems, starting soon after he arrived in America in 1959. 
Bruce quickly became convinced that the atmosphere in the circle of martial arts fans in San Francisco was completely different from the one he was used to in Hong Kong. For three decades, the Wu Lin policy, the name for the traditional Chinese martial arts community in Chinatown, was defined by two representatives of the local Tong, the so-called secret Chinese societies in the USA and Canada. These men were Lao Ban and Ti Wong. Lao Ban opened Hong Zing, probably the first open school of Chinese martial arts in the United States. He maintained strict discipline among his students, as well as other Chinese martial arts schools in Chinatown. For many years, Lao Ban prohibited showdowns between representatives of the various martial arts schools, something that Bruce had gotten used to in Hong Kong in the 1950s, in which challenging each other's skills to fight among rival martial arts schools was commonplace. T. Wong came to San Francisco from China in the early 1940s. As a junior member of the Tong, he often kept order in the Forbidden City nightclubs. His school was called Kin Man, which can be translated as Healthy Citizen Club. Like Lao Ban, T. Wong demanded strict discipline from his students. Rumors of wild customs prevailing in Hong Kong, in which China's century-old traditions were violated, as well as the formidable reputation of Wing Chun students, preceded the appearance of Bruce Lee in San Francisco. Bruce Lee spent 10 years studying Wing Chun with the legendary Yip Man of Hong Kong. The economical, fast, and direct style of Wing Chun preached an attack on the center line in combination with short punches and kicks at close range. The style had a reputation for being practical and effective which was of paramount importance in the streets of post-war Hong Kong. Immediately after his arrival in San Francisco, Bruce Lee attended Lao Ban's school. When Bruce arrived at Hong Zing, he did not know anything about the rules in San Francisco, says Sam Lu Yi, who was one of Lao Ban's senior students at that time. At this moment, seven or eight students attended the lesson. He tried several of our exercises and stated that Wing Chun is better. Naturally, the martial arts teacher took him out of the hall. Right after that, all the doors in Chinatown closed for Bruce. These conflicts only increased over time, as Bruce Lee was not shy about criticizing the traditional school's approach to the study of martial arts. In a book published by James Lee, Bruce dismantled and mercilessly criticized the techniques from T. Wong's books, published a little earlier. Naturally, these insults did not go unnoticed. Therefore, the opinion of T. Wong, who called Bruce a dissident with bad manners, was shared by the vast majority of Chinese martial arts communities in Chinatown. And so it happened. At just the right moment, Wong Jackman arrived in San Francisco. He quickly gained a reputation as a well-educated young man who respected the traditions and authority of his elders. And at the same time, he was a great fighter. He became the first representative of the Northern Shaolin styles in Chinatown and impressed everyone with their demonstration. In many ways, this style was the exact opposite of Wing Chun. Sweeping kicks and kicks from long distances in combination with acrobatic elements, Chinatown accepted Wong as unconditionally as it had rejected Bruce Lee. Dissident at the beginning of 1964, Bruce significantly strengthened his early criticism of the ineffective styles and techniques and began giving demonstration lectures in which he proved the superiority of his new methods over swimmers who learned to swim on land and who practiced classic turbidity. In contrast, he called his approach scientific street fighting. As a rule, at these lectures, Bruce demonstrated techniques of other styles and then he took them apart piece by piece, methodically explaining why this would not work in street fighting. It is no coincidence that one of the styles that he liked to disassemble and criticize in front of a large audience was Northern Shaolin. At the first famous Long Beach martial arts tournament hosted by Ed Parker, Bruce annoyed many participants after criticizing many traditional practices, such as the Kiba Dacha or the Maba horse stance, he just came and started criticizing people, explains Barney Skolan, who was 18 years old at the time of the tournament. 
Although Bruce's appearance at the Long Beach tournament is often portrayed as a triumphal success, many of the participants do not hide the fact that they, at the time, considered him an impudent person. Clarence Lee, with more than a half century experience, recalls, guys practically stood in line to fight with Bruce Lee after his demonstration on Long Beach. In the summer of 1964, Bruce Lee accompanied Hong Kong actress Diane Chang Chung Ven, the Chinese Marilyn Monroe of the time, on her promotional tour of the U.S. West Coast to support her latest film. This led them to the Sung Sing Cinema, located in the heart of Chinatown, San Francisco. Naturally, Bruce could not miss such an opportunity to make his demonstration, which further enraged the representatives of Chinese martial arts in San Francisco. In this demonstration, Bruce called traditional Chinese martial arts old toothless tigers. Naturally, such a hint could not help but touch Lao Ban in Ti Wong. It was an insult to two highly respected members of the Chinese community, made by an arrogant upstart. At this point, a confrontation was inevitable, given that several years before that, the martial arts community in Seattle challenged Bruce for much smaller statements. Japanese karateka Yoichi Nakachi challenged Bruce during a similar demonstration, in which Bruce criticized karate. Yoichi pursued Bruce for several weeks. When they finally got together in a duel, Bruce literally destroyed Yoichi by conducting a series of quick punches and ending the fight with a knockout kick. The whole battle lasted 11 seconds and Yoichi was hospitalized with a fractured skull. It is strange that this meeting is usually hushed up as insignificant, although in reality, it's an indicative example of Bruce's future. The Forgotten Fight why did Wong Jackman challenge Bruce? Now we come to the most interesting part of the story. There is a theory that he simply wanted to make a name for himself and advertise his school, which he opened in Chinatown in San Francisco. Local Tai Chi Chuan master David Chin claims this is exactly what Wong said when he signed the call, which was then delivered to Bruce Lee. However, many believe that Wong was pushed to make the decision, sending him like a new kid at school at the main troublemaker. But who were the five guys who went to Oakland with Wong Jackman? Next to Wong sat David Chin and Chan Baldhead Kyung, two representatives of the Tai Chi Club, which had appeared in Chinatown in the 1930s. In the back seat were a trio of dubious men who were not directly related to the Wu Len, Ronald Yaya Wu, who earned his nickname for constant chatter, Martin Wong and Raymond Fong. As Wong Jackman later admitted, they were brought along for numbers. None of those in the car was a student of T. Wong or Lao Ban, but there were two representatives of the Tai Chi Chuan Club in it. As Lao Ban's senior student, Sam Lu Yi, recalls, the school's code forbade participation in such actions. If you break into someone else's room, this is not good. Regardless of whether you lose or win, this is not good. When Wong Jackman arrived in Oakland, there were only two witnesses near Bruce Lee, his wife Linda, who was at that moment in her eighth month of pregnancy, and his most faithful friend and colleague, James Lee. Having a lot of experience with showdowns, James carried a loaded gun in case the situation got out of hand. There were nine people in the room, three of whom are alive today. Wong Jackman never talked about this incident. Linda Lee and David Chin, who were on the opposite sides of the conflict, tell the same story. The battle was fast and furious. The fighters moved around the room. It all looked rude, chaotic, and did not look like a movie. At first, Bruce managed to punch Wong's temple, but Wong withstood the blow and began to dodge Bruce's attack. Unable to defeat the enemy in a few seconds, as with the last time in Seattle, Bruce had to chase Wong around the room eventually tiring him. However, it was precisely Bruce's furious advance that led to his victory. Wong stumbled over a small step and fell to the floor. Bruce rushed at him and shouted in the Cantonese dialect, Are you giving up? and began to shower him with blows. At that moment, Wong said he was surrendering and the fight was over. David Chin recalls, it all lasted no more than seven minutes. Subsequently, this fight has grown to epic proportions. Rumors that Bruce had punched the wall with Wong's head, or that Wong had already defeated Bruce when the cops arrived, were just a few examples among many. Probably the most absurd exaggeration was the film The Birth of the Dragon, 
in which the battle lasted more than 20 minutes. However, Bruce Lee himself learned a valuable lesson from this story that made him reconsider many of his beliefs. After a year, with absolutely no reservation in preaching the effectiveness of his technique in comparison with others, the collision with Wong Jackman forced him to reconsider both his technique and physical training, which actually turned out to be not so good. The good news was that it was at this moment when Bruce began the formation of his new system, Jeet Kune Do. He had already begun to synthesize many of the things that had influenced him in the recent years. From the practicality of street fighter James Lee to the innovations of Wally J, causing him to form an integrated system suitable for his personality. Bruce also included elements of Wing Chun, fencing, boxing, and wrestling based on the philosophical approach of Zen in the Jeet Kune Do. In this picture, Bruce Lee, back row in the center, with his students in the James Lee Garage, back row third from left, in 1965. During the time spent by Bruce in Oakland, the foundations of his martial arts were laid, although this period remains rather unknown even after thoroughly studying his biography. Today, Bruce Lee is often called the father of MMA, not just because he mixed styles. The mixing of styles was already going on before his time. But, first of all, because of the fact that he emphasized the effectiveness of technology and its constant evolution. He learned this lesson, in particular, from his collision with Wong Jackman. In conclusion, let us cite the words of David Chin, who, despite supporting Wong at the time, now says, what Bruce said then turned out to be true. I did not agree with him at the time, but he was right. If you like the video or you want more stories about Bruce Lee, press the like button and please leave a comment. See you next time.